And so uh, John chapter 3, let's read. We won't read the whole chapter, but we will read uh, a few verses here. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up, into, up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Great verse, famous verse, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Great verses around this verse as well that kind of get overlooked sometimes. Verse 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be uh, reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We'll stop right there. You can see from the text here <clears throat> what's going on. You have this conversation with Jesus Christ and Nicodemus. It seems to be what appears to be a private conversation. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's an elite, um, um, uh, if you will, man of the day as far as a religious man and of that order. And uh, uh, he's coming to Jesus Christ by night. And uh, Jesus Christ um, uh, takes the time to uh, talk with him and to uh, deal with him. Now Nicodemus here, he recognizes uh, that God uh, was behind or with, if you will, Jesus Christ. You see that from verse 2. We know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles which thou doest except God be with him. So he's recognizing right off the bat. If you know anything about your Bible at all, you know the Pharisees had a large part in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But you recognize here Nicodemus is, is a, acknowledging Hey, we know thou art come from God. We know God is with you. We know God is involved here somewhere. I haven't got my finger on it yet, but we know the Lord's with you. And not only he himself, but he says, we, we know. In other words, there was probably more than one Pharisee. Maybe not at this meeting, but probably back at, the, uh, at, the, at headquarters, you know. There was probably more there that just were not uh, willing to step out there and be seen having a conversation with Jesus Christ. After all, he comes by night. Matter of fact, if you read over there, I think it's in John 9 or John 12, uh, where it talks about those men, some of those men, they loved the praise of God, uh, praise of men more than the praise of God. And they were fearful that they uh, would acknowledge that they believe on Christ, lest they be cast out of the, out of the temple. So they were, they were fearful of some things, and they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. But Nicodemus here, his interest gets the best of him, and he comes to Jesus Christ by night, even as a Pharisee. And he's talking about here, what's under discussion is the new birth, being saved, salvation. Now, I realize this is, for many of you, this is a very simple subject. But you know something, uh, we ought to glory in being saved. Not in and of ourselves, but we glory in Jesus Christ and the cross. We can glory in Him, we can thank God for salvation. Uh, if God saved you, He saved you from a devil's hell. 
He saved you from the eternal flames of hell. He saved you from the torment that's there. And He washed all your sins away. And He gave you a home in heaven, a bright future, an eternal future with a new body with Christ for all eternity. Salvation is a great thing. Being born again is a great thing. And we ought to be preaching, uh, witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ that people need to be born again constantly. Uh, every day when we get a chance. I know that wisdom is involved and all that kind of thing, but uh, we ought to be actively involved. This past week, there was a conscious effort that went out, even though some of these children are very small, and th- before you get, don't get too excited, we're not, we didn't twist anybody's arm to get saved. And we could have, but we didn't. We let those children decide on their own. We make sure our people know that and try to use wisdom in that and just try to answer the questions uh, accordingly and all those kind of things and all that. But it is a great thing to be saved. And we try to, uh, as I was saying this past week, we made a conscious effort to put the gospel out there and to put it out forward. Not only that, not here, but as Brother Adam said, with all those flyers and mailers that went out, trying to present the gospel to this surrounding area. 4,000 homes. That's pretty good if you ask me. Oh, well, thank God for the opportunity we can have to do that. And you say, well, I don't see no fruit of it. It doesn't make any difference. It's our job to plant the seed. It's our job to preach it. It's our job to plant, water, all that. And it's God's job to give the increase. Amen. Let Him worry about all that. Do we want to see people saved? Absolutely. And when we get the chance, we'll lead them to Christ. We'll lead them to the Lord. But it's His, it's His, it's His uh, if you will, obligation and His... His doing and His power that any, anybody gets saved. It's our job to preach it and to plant it and sow the seed in the water and so on and so forth. So what he's talking about here is being born again and he's talking about being born again into the kingdom of God. I won't go through a big long dissertation, but the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is the two different things. They are never, never, ever the same in the Bible. Never, ever. The kingdom of heaven deals with a literal physical kingdom that Jesus Christ sets up on this earth. Here on the earth. Just very quickly, if you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 14. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Hold your place in John 3. We're going to come right back there. Are you still with me? Look in Romans chapter 14. Now I know a lot of you know this. Maybe some of you don't. The kingdom of God is not the same as the kingdom of heaven. And again, there's a whole, you could preach a whole sermon on this. But look in Romans chapter 14. Look at verse number 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In other words... It's, it's not physical. It's not something that's tangible physically. It's, it's spiritual. Notice what he says. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We're talking about being born again into the kingdom of God. One more reference. Come with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. One book before John there. Luke chapter 17. We're moving fast. We're moving fast. Luke chapter 17. And you'll notice with me, Verse number 20, Luke 17, 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is what? Within you. Within you. It's not something on the outside. It's not a physical throne of Christ sitting there or something they could watch and look at and observe. But it's within you. It's, it's when a man receives Jesus Christ by faith. Come back to John chapter 3. There's more that we could say about some of that, but we'll let that suffice uh, for now. So what's under discussion here is, is birth, being born again into the kingdom of God, into the family of God. Uh, just to put it bluntly and shortly and plainly, uh, what's under discussion here is, uh, is a man being saved and how to be saved. All right, so that's, that's what's being uh, discussed. That's what's being talked about. Now, obviously, uh, nobody at this time is being born into the kingdom of God. Nobody's born into the kingdom of God until after the resurrection. So, well, John's writing it here in John chapter 3. I know that, but he's writing it after the resurrection. Amen. Uh, So what are you saying? Uh, Those people in the New Testament, as far as the church age, uh, we're born into the kingdom of God. We're born into the family of God. We're saved. We're born again. We're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Back in the Old Testament, they didn't have that. New Testament, after the resurrection and the crucifixion of Christ, we have that. We have that availability to us. So that's, that's simple, preacher. We know all that. Aren't you glad it's simple? 
You know how many people there are out there that hasn't got a hold of that thing? They didn't have that thing back there in the Old Testament. Look with me in Psalm 22, if you will, quickly. Although you may find some references here in the Old Testament, nobody back there is looking forward to the cross for salvation. That thing was hidden to them. Come to Psalm 22, and here's a, here's a prophetic reference to it. Psalm 22, if I can get there. Psalm 22, and you'll notice the crucifixion here. Verse 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who said that? Jesus Christ himself says that while he's hanging on the cross. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. In the night season, and I'm not silent. Goes on about some of this stuff down through. We won't read it all, but look there in verse number 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Jesus Christ, was he not despised? Was he not a reproach of men? He said, but I am a worm and no man. He's suffering the hell that you and I would be suffering have we, have we not received Jesus Christ. And we die in our sins without receiving Him by faith. A man that does that, it dies without Christ, he goes to hell and his soul becomes like that of a worm. Where The Bible says, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Where their worm dieth not, over there in Mark, what is that, Mark 9, Mark 5, Mark 9. Uh, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He says that three or four times over in that passage. Jesus Christ is suffering our hell while he's hanging on that cross. Why do you think he said, I thirst? <laughs> There's no water in hell. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Didn't they say that to the Lord? They sure did. Boy, they, they railed on him and mocked him. Uh, uh, you say you're the Son of God? Why don't you ha why don't, why, crawl, crawl on him to save you? Matter of fact, he said, Eli, Eli, Lobak, Sama, I forget how he says it now. Lobak, Samathai, I forget how he says it. All that uh, Hebrew stuff and all that and Greek and all that over there. But, but he's, they said, He called it for Elias, which is interpreted. He's saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then they begin to mock him. You say you're the son of God? Well, you saved others? Save yourself. Come on down. Verse 8. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. See how they mock him? But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou just take, make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Well, who is as a roaring lion? When the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What's going on on that cross is a, is a spiritual battle with unclean spirits all around him and just attacking him. Uh, the eye that could, not, that could not behold it, and we'll never understand it probably until we get home to heaven. But that not, there, was a, there was a physical aspect of that crucifixion. There was the wrath of God being poured out on him. And there was, a, a, it was unclean, a supernatural aspect of that whole battle. That was a battleground, brother, at Calvary. Thank God for the victor. Amen. Verse 13, verse uh, 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my mouth. My strength is dried up like I posture it, and my tongue cleaveth in my jaws. There's that I thirst. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced, watch it, they pierced my hands and my feet. If that ain't crucifixion, I've never seen it. Look at verse 17. I may tell all my bones. They didn't break none of them, did they? They look and stare upon me. The Bible says they sat down and watched him there, just staring at him. They parted my garments among them. They cast lots from my vesture. Did they not do that? Soldiers down at the foot of the cross, shooting dice for the garment. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. There's some more we can read on down through here. Say, so where are you going? I'm showing you the crucifixion in the Old Testament. But look down, look now, look down to verse uh, 29. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. Verse 30, a seed shall serve him. Cross-reference to Isaiah 53. A seed shall serve him. 
Who? Jesus Christ. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Now look at 31. They shall come and shall declare His righteousness unto a people that shall be born that He hath done this. You know what we are? We're born again. We're saved. Come back to John chapter 3. We're born again by the grace of God. We got, that's, that's being saved. That's salvation. All right, let me give you a few things here very quickly, and I'm going to be finished. I have got to hurry. I'm already behind. I'm looking at the clock here. I do have a clock here. It don't work, but I do have a clock here. <laughs> John chapter 3. First thing I want you to notice, I want you to notice some manifestations that Jesus Christ points out. We didn't read it, but look up in chapter 2, verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There's a manifestation that comes about from these past few verses here, these three verses in chapter 2 and then down into chapter 3. You say, what is it, preacher? Number one, the manifest, he, mani he manifests sin. You know what he's showing Nicodemus? Hey, bud, all your good works ain't good enough. All that scripture you got memorized and your little phylactery that you're carrying around, that ain't good enough. All those good deeds you're doing, all those alms you're doing, all that fasting you're doing, all that praying you're doing, all that preaching and teaching you're doing, it ain't good enough. Huh. That's what he's telling him. Say, so why? Because he's a sinner. You know what the Lord knows about all men there in verse 24 and 25 of chapter 2? He knows what's in man. He knew all men. He didn't need nobody to testify about, to him about man. He knows man inside and out. He knows he's a sinner. Why? By, by his own inspiration. The psalmist pens. Man at his best state is altogether vanity. By his own inspiration, Paul writes, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So what, what are you saying? I'm saying the manifestation in chapter 2 into chapter 3 here, one of the manifestations is simply, you're a sinner. Nicodemus, you're a sinner. Religious man, you're a sinner. All men are sinners. You're a sinner. You're a sinner by choice. All men are sinners. And God demands payment for sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Thank God for the rest of the verse, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a manifestation. Men need to understand they're sinners. They don't believe that they're bad enough for God to reject them. Oh, yes, you are. Without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God will reject you. You approach God in your own righteousness with all your sin. Listen, Isaiah says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You've got to have the righteousness of God, just like Paul did. How do you get that? By believing in Jesus Christ. By believing on Jesus Christ. All right, so there's a manifestation of sin. It doesn't take a, too many people to really understand that. Whether you believe it or not, it's a fact. All men are sinners and guilty before God. Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 3, pl cl plainly and clearly lays this out. If you know yourself at all, you know you're a sinner. You've watched yourself. You get in a tight spot. You'll lie. You'll lie. Whether it's a white lie, so-called, or a, a flat-out, vulgar, black, filthy, uh, nasty lie. You'll lie. You'll fudge. You'll bend. All men are liars. All men are sinners. Guilty before God. I mean, if we took the Ten Commandments and put them up here and stacked you up against it, you're guilty on almost every account. You're guilty. You know what you are? You're a sinner. Men are sinners. Men are, you know what men are? They're sinners. You don't believe that? Go out there and deal with them for a while. Come with me to the prison on Wednesday morning and deal with them for a while. Amen. You know what you'll find out? They're sinners. You know why, you know why we have the things going on in this world we got going on? Because men are sinners. All the corruptness of the government, all the, all the stuff that you hear on the streets and what goes on on the streets and in the school systems. Why? Men are sinners. You know why you lock your doors at night? You know why you lock your car door in the parking lot? 
You know why some of you have a CCW? Because men are sinners. You know why we have a police department? Thank God we do. All these idiots talking about defunding the police. Go to Canada somewhere. Amen. You know why we have them? Because men are sinners. Amen. Number two, about this manifestation. Uh, not only does he manifest sin, he manifests salvation. He tells Nicodemus there in, in chapter 3, verse 3, you must be born again. In verse 5, in verse 7, in verses 15 to 18, also all the way down in verse 36, which we didn't read. You know, what he's, you know what he's showing you? Salvation. You must be born again. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What he's talking about? Talking about salvation. Talking about being born again. Talking about receiving Jesus Christ. Talking about being gloriously saved. Isn't it wonderful to be saved? I'm glad I got born again, what, 41 years ago now. Whew. 41 years ago as a young lad, a young boy, nine years old, got on my knees and received Jesus Christ by faith as my Savior. I asked Him to come into my heart and save my soul. I've been saved ever since. Amen. I haven't always been what I'm supposed to be, but thank God for the sealing of the Holy Spirit of God who sealed me and is going to perform His work in me till the day He comes and gets me. He's the one who saved me. He's the one that's keeping me. Praise God for salvation. I have no regrets about being saved. None whatsoever. This business of salvation, I want to say this. Number one, it's a belief. It's a belief. It's a belief in the heart that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The, in one form of the word or another, uh, believe, believe, believeth, it shows up. You'll never believe it, but it's... You'll, not, no pun intended. You'll, you'll never believe it, but it shows up. How many times in chapter 3? Nine times. And you know what the number nine is in your Bible? Some of you Bible, you know what I'm talking about. It's a number fruit bearing, bearing fruit. You know what we're talking about? Being born, birth. You know what that is? Mother carries a baby, nine months, and pfft, a baby's born into that family. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't. Listen, don't mess with the King James Bible. Just leave it alone. You'll learn more from it just by reading it and believing it. We're talking about being saved. So what do you do, preacher? You believe on Christ. We don't have time to read all the verses, but you believe on Christ. We're in chapter 3. Look back there at chapter 1. Look down there at verse number 12. I like to quote the verse all the time. It's a good verse. But as many as received Him, that's Christ, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You know what salvation is? It's believing on Christ. I love that illustration the old preacher used to use. I use it at the pr prison all the time. But if I put, put this chair, none of these chairs, I don't trust these chairs. That's, well, I won't tell you what those chairs are. But if I had a chair up here, had four good legs, set that right down the middle and say, okay, you believe that chair holds you? I believe that chair is good enough to support you? You believe that's a good chair? And you say, I believe in the chair, I believe in the chair, I believe in the chair. But until you believe on the chair and sit in the chair and put all of your faith on the chair, you're not exercising your faith. You can say it all day long. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Okay, but have you believed on Him? Have you forsaken yourself and all your good works and everything that you're doing trying to get you to heaven and believed on Christ? I'm trusting you. God, you know I'm a sinner. You died for me. Lord, all this stuff I know is filthy rags. I need you to save me. I need your righteousness. Would you come into my heart and save my soul? What are you talking about? That's Bible salvation. That's believing on Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Man, isn't that good? It's belief. We're in chapter 3. He says that in verse 12. He says it in verse 15. He says it in verse 16. He says it in verse 18 three times. He says it in verse 36 two times. That's nine times. Birth. You believe on Christ? Born into the family of God. Uh, we're talking about salvation, it's belief, it's a birth. We've already mentioned that about the nine times and all that. You're born again. What's born again? Your spirit's born again. Your soul is now saved, but your spirit is born again because it was dead in trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2. 
So your spirit is made alive. It's quickened. It's born again. Amen. That is salvation. The spirit is now born again. The soul is saved. And if the Lord don't come, this old body is going to the ground. But then when he does come, I'm getting a brand new one. I can't go to a funeral without thinking about 1 Corinthians 15. I cannot go to a graveyard, a graveside service of a saved man, almost any anymore, and not think about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. With the Lord coming back, and I hope He, I hope He tears up the ground, busts open those vaults, tears up all those caskets that everybody spends thousands of dollars on, busts them all to pieces. So why? Going to get a new body. And it's coming out of there. It's going to be a body fashion like unto His glorious body. Say so why? All one day, I got born into the family of God. I got born again. Jesus Christ said, you must be born again. So, manifestation of sin, manifestation of salvation. I want to say it's belief, it's birth. I want to say this, it's in a being or a person. It's in Jesus Christ. It's not in the Baptist church. Salvation is not in the Catholic church. It's not in baptism. It's not in the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, anything else. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. And then secondly, I want to say this. I want you to notice his ministration. You have his manifestation of sin and salvation, and you have the ministration. So what do you mean? He ministers to Nicodemus here. I want you to notice the seriousness now of this conversation. You notice verse 2 and 3, and then also in verse 5. Nicodemus, so what are you saying? Nicodemus comes to him with this flattery. We know that, Rabbi, we know that our teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest, except, and the Lord just cuts that off. Let me tell you something, Nicodemus. Except you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. He eliminates all. Why? It's a serious matter. This is a serious matter. Being saved is a serious matter. It is the most important thing you'll ever do in your entire life. Why do you preach salvation? That's why. It's important. It's serious. And you see Jesus Christ here. He's not laughing. He's not joking. He's not making light of it. A guy walked up to me back here uh, some time ago, and some of the other guys were standing here, uh, sitting here, a few of our guys, and he says, So, <laughs> what do you think is Jesus' character and his Jesus' story? And I thought, Man, you're talking about my Savior. You're talking about my God. You guys actually believe that? You say, well, he was joking. I don't care. It's a serious thing. I know we can laugh and have fun and enjoy God and enjoy our salvation. But man, don't joke about Jesus Christ in a condescending manner. He's God for crying out loud. He's my God and my Savior. And I love him. Don't do that. I said, yeah, I believe it. I believe every bit of it. <laughs> Why? It's a serious thing. I'm going to say this. I'm trying to hurry. More I could say there. In verse 5, look at verse 5. It says it in verse 3 and also verse 5. Jesus answered, verily, verily. You know what that means? <laughs> yeah, folks, oh, yeah. Show enough. <laughs> this, this is serious. Verily, verily. Hey, wake up. Pay attention, Nicodemus. Get this. Verily, verily. Man, get this. Serious. Then I'm going to say, yet in his ministration, he's very serious, but yet he's serene and yet very stern. So what do you mean? He's gentle. He's firm. He's serene, but yet he's stern. He's gentle in his answer here, but make no mistake about it, you better get born again. If you don't, you're going to hell. That's, that's the message coming across here. He's not standing up there yelling at him. He's here having a conversation. He's being very gentle. He's being kind. He's being very serene. A soft answer turneth away wrath. He's doing all of that, but yet he's still yet. He's, he's being firm. He's being stern. You've got to be born again. Ain't no other way, Nicodemus. It's being born again. You want to see the kingdom of God? You've got to be born again. 
Well, I love how the Lord handles things. I love watching him and reading the Gospels and how he handles himself. I mean, he's got everything under control. In his own emotion and temperament is always under control. He can be so serene yet stern at the same time in his ministration here on this matter of salvation. So what are you saying? Well, we street preach. I believe in it. You make no apologies for it. But there's more to it than standing out there and telling everybody they're going to go to hell. Give them the gospel. Every soul that passes you by, whether it's walking or riding, you need to pay, put a check on that and say, that one could be going to hell. I might be their last shot. I know there's all kind of guys out there that, are giving, that give uh, God's, man, God's men and God's ladies that stand out there and hold scripture signs and preach. They give them a bad name. Let me ask some of you guys. When was the last time you stood out there and you wept, Like Jeremiah said. Mine eye affecteth my heart. My tears run down my face like rivers of waters for the daughter of my people. And beg them not to go to hell. So I ain't going to beg anybody not to go to hell. Man, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? His ministration was serene yet stern. I'm going to say lastly, I'm trying to hurry. You see his manifestation, you see his ministration, and you see that it's a must. It's mandatory. What's that? Being born again. We've kind of mentioned it already, but I want to say this about it being a must and mandatory. It's, it's solitary. It's singular. There is no other way. This is the only single way. If you want to go to heaven, that you'll go. That is by being born again. It's singular. It's solitary. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. You know the verse. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is but one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It's not St. Bartholomew. It's not Mary. It's the man, Christ Jesus. It's not the babe in the manger. It's the man, Christ Jesus. You want to get to God? You want to see the kingdom of God? You want to be saved? You want to go to heaven when you leave this old God-forsaken world? Then well, you've got to go through Jesus Christ. He is the door. It's the solitary singular way. There's only one way. Not many roads as Oprah would have you believe or as any other philosopher out there or as any other, so, some, some religious leaders will back up and crawfish when they're asked. No, there's one way. You can say, I mean, be careful. You can say what you want to about Jerry Falwell and some of the stuff he might have got into before he, before he left this world and went home to heaven. But I'll tell you this, the night, the, day I, the night I heard him on the Michael Savage show on the radio, the man stood there and proclaimed to two million listeners, Michael Savage, there's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. And he, oh, you mean to tell me all these Muslims, all these Hindus, all these Indians, all these people? He said they got to go one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. That's what he's saying on the radio to two million listeners. I said, amen, Lord, bless Him. Give Him a backbone. Give Him words. Give Him wisdom. And give Him discernment. Help Him, God. I'll tip my hat to anybody to do that to two million people. Amen? Amen. It's the only way. It's a must. Jesus Christ said, you must. That's not a recommendation. That's not if you think so, if you feel like it, if you're sincere and something else, okay. No, he said, you must be born again. You must. You understand? You must. We don't like that. Human nature don't like that. God says, you must. You can't get out of it. There's only one way. That's being born again. And then I'm going to say in verse number 7, I'm done. He says, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. I have no doubt that when that conversation is over and under the starlit night and the cool breeze is blowing, Nicodemus is looking at Jesus Christ and he's heard some things he's never heard before. 
and Jesus Christ just cool as a cucumber and gentlemanly and serenity all over him, yet his firmness and sternness is there. He can see that he's speaking with authority. And in the, in the cool of the night, and some of maybe even the sounds of the night and some of the things going on in the midst of all that, probably sometimes before some of this stuff is being said, probably be a pause here and there, and Nicodemus just looking at him, scratching his head, how can a man be born when he is old? And Jesus Christ goes through that thing, a man born of water and of the Spirit. Fleshly birth, spiritual birth. That's the water in the context, no baptism at all. He's given all this to him, and through the stillness of the night, that whole conversation comes to a close as he comes down through there and gives him that explanation down there, verse 13, 14, and 15, about the serpent being raised in the wilderness. He's showing him Moses back there. He knew the first five books of Moses. He had them memorized. He's saying, he's saying, Nicodemus, that serpent on the pole, that's me. And then he gives him the greatest verse of all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You've got to be born again, Nicodemus. I don't know where that conversation ends. But I can imagine when it ends and Jesus Christ turns and walks away, Nicodemus is just kind of sitting there with his jaw on the table of the floor. He said, marvel not. You know what it is? It's a stunning statement. We've seen it advertised and published and heard it preached sometimes so much in America. Oh, people yawn at it, but you know what? You must be born again. It is a stunning statement. It's a must. It's mandatory. And it is a very stunning statement. You tell this lost world, you must, you must be born again. Ah. But every now and then, some old lost sinner will hear that. And the Holy Spirit of God will arrest their soul and bring conviction upon that lost sinner. And they'll realize the manifestation of that they're lost and without Jesus Christ. They're a sinner, guilty before God, and then salvation is presented to them with all serenity, but yet sternness and firmness. And then the invitation is given. And they're stunned. And God gets a hold of their heart. And they see the glorious love of God manifested and displayed at Calvary. Boy, I saw that as a young lad, and I said, that is for me. I don't want that other stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't want this. The only flame that I'll ever feel, that my soul will ever feel, as that old song says, is the one that's burning in my heart. That's it. What are you saying, preacher? You must be born again. Are you born again? Isn't it good to be born again? If you're not born again, you know what you need to do? You need to get born again today. You need to get born again right now. Is it right now? Yeah, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. It's very simple. You can be born again right now. Let's stand for prayer.